good. So we're back to hydrogen again. As I said, we're going to spend a long time on this. Um, and this is a relatively simplistic view of the excitation levels available to our one electron uh, associated with the hydrogen atom. So here's our proton in the middle, the nucleus. Obviously, this is not to any sort of sensible scale. Here's the ground state. So this is this is what we would normally associate with the diameter of a hydrogen atom. This is the orbit of our electron in the ground state uh, of hydrogen. But we can excite it. We can excite it to n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on um, through a series until we get to the point where we've ionized the hydrogen. We've removed its electron altogether. And then we get relaxation processes. We get transitions back again <coughs> towards the ground state, towards n equals 1. And that can happen in small steps. It can go you know, from, one, uh, from n equals 4 to n equals 3, <coughs> for instance. Or it can go all the way back to n equals 1 in one step. It doesn't matter. Going back to what I said earlier about initial states and final states, all we've got to have is somewhere for it to go. So if, it, if, it's a, if it's an existing, a viable excitation level, then our electron can make a transition to that level. It doesn't have to go all the way in one step. It can go to any intermediate uh, levels en route. Are there only seven hydrogen? Um, no, it, 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 it does go on. But actually, you know, we'll, we'll do some calculations on this later on. But what you'll see is that the gap between energy levels gets really, really small and it ceases to be sensible to talk about it. Um, and, you know, they sort of so merge into n equals infinity, as it were. Um, so, you know, in terms of measuring things in easy lab experiments, then n equals 7 or 8 is probably, a, probably your limit. You need exceptionally fine resolution to your equipment to go beyond that because you just can't distinguish between the next few coming up. Um, okay, so we've got um, a photon coming out, packet of energy, um, when an electron makes a transition back to a lower uh, quantum number, a lower <laughs> excitation um, level. Um, and we can relate our photon frequency or wavelength, if you like, to, um, to the energy of the photon in a very straightforward way. And this is an <coughs> equation I would suggest it's a good idea to, um, uh, to hang on to, as it were, um, as something important to remember. So let me just try to have a piece of chalk here. We've got this equation that relates energy to the frequency uh, of our photon, and that's going to be in joules, right? Standard SI units. And it's related through this constant here called Planck's constant. Sorry? Okay, you all right now? Good. Um, Planck's constant's given on the screen there. It's 6.6 um, .6 times 10 to the minus 34 uh, um, of a joule. All right, and the frequency is in hertz, so it's in cycles per second. All right, and this is essentially the color of the light. So a standard wave equation for all waves, <coughs> and telling you that the wave speed <coughs> is the frequency times the wavelength. So if we're talking about photons, we're talking about the speed of light. All right. So this is the speed of light, this is the frequency, and this then is the wavelength. And I suppose wavelength is the same thing that we would most easily think about in terms of um, colors of things. Right? But you're going to get really fluent in, uh, in thinking about colors in terms of, of energy and so on as well at some point. We'll do a lot of this next term when we look at waves and vibrations. I'm just introducing, needing to use a little bit of it now uh, as we go through. So in terms of, of doing experiments and measuring this stuff, 
the easiest and therefore the first experiments that were done were those transitions that gave off photons that were in the visible part of the spectrum. And actually that turned out to be transitions back to the n equals 2 level. Because going back to the ground state was just way too much energy. The wavelength would have been really short. It's ultraviolet, as I mentioned earlier, outside the visible part of the spectrum. So that required the development of more specialist equipment. So the very first experiments were done were all done on this particular excitation here. And just with the sort of discharge tube apparatus that I sketched up um, in yesterday's lecture. So we can do these experiments in two ways. Because we can look at transitions up the energy level ladder, or we can look at transitions as our electron comes back down again towards the ground state. So if we're looking at transitions going up the energy level ladder, we're looking at our gas atoms absorbing energy. Right? Taking energy from the electrons or the photons or whatever it is we're using uh, to pump energy in. Right? So that's called an absorption spectrum. So you shine light of all sorts of wavelengths of the sample, it will actually absorb only particular wavelengths or frequencies. Precisely those frequencies that allow an energy that corresponds to a gap between one of these excitation levels, and only at those frequencies. Everything else just <coughs> sails straight through. All right, so for typical window glass, we get all the way to about, I don't know, six, seven electron volts before we start getting serious absorption. In the visible region and just beyond it, we're getting quite good transmission. <coughs> but we can look at it the other way around as well. So we can look at the photons given off <coughs> when our electron relaxes back towards eventually the ground state. And that's called an emission spectrum. And they're both the same, all right? One of them uh, is going to give us bright lines. It's photons being given out as our system relaxes back towards its ground state. And then the other one, uh, it's dark lines in exactly the same position, but that's now corresponding to energy being absorbed <coughs> as our electron is going up the excitation series. Precisely the same information in both but gathered, obviously, in, in rather different ways. Right, now, this is focused very much on visible wavelengths, so we've got a prism in here and you know, standard sort of stuff for splitting our, um, our light up into its various colors, its various frequencies. Um, if we were going to do this beyond the visible part of the spectrum, uh, we tend not to use prisms. We use other things, things like diff uh, guys, do you mind? No, I just something that, that, does this relate to the thing that like, if something is going away, it's red, and if it's coming toward you? No, know, that's, that's somewhat different. That's the Doppler effect, which we will talk about next term. Yeah. Um, and again, we'll talk about how this part of the mechanism gets developed next term when we talk about diffraction gratings. Because um, these are obviously limited. If your glass won't transmit these frequencies anymore, then it's a pretty useless instrument. But OK, so we can build a spectrometer, essentially something that will measure this effect. <coughs> and here's the output from an emission spectrometer. Here's the output from an absorption spectrometer. And this absorption spectrum, or emission spectrum equivalently, um, is what was used in those early experiments to give us the energy level diagram for hydrogen. And it's that one we're going to focus on a lot. Uh, it's also, again as an aside, some of you will know that the element helium was first discovered not on the Earth but on the Sun. And it was by looking at uh, <coughs> absorption spectra. The outer atmosphere of the Sun was actually absorbing the photons coming out of the sun at those frequencies that corresponded to the excitation spectra of helium. 
Nobody knew it was helium then, nobody had given it a name then, but these were absorption lines that nobody had spotted in any other element in that part of the periodic table. So actually helium was first identified through one of these experiments by looking at sunlight, looking at the absorption lines uh, in sunlight. Um, and then it was found later on. It was hunted down, as it were, and found uh, on the Earth. But we're going to stick with hydrogen. And the first experiments were done by this guy, Johann uh, Balmer, at the end of the 19th century on the visible part of the spectrum. So remember that diagram I showed you earlier that corresponds to uh, energy levels relaxing back to n equals 2. Right? Not back to the ground state, but just to the one above it. And he came up with a <coughs> workable formula that described all the results he saw. And that's it. Top of the page. What he realized is that with some constant in here, uh, he could predict where all of the other frequencies were going to be, matching the experiment, uh, using what's inside the bracket there. So 1 over 4 minus 1 over n squared, and n is 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or whatever. Now I've written it as 1 over 2 squared for reasons that I hope will become amazingly obvious by the time we've reached the bottom of the slide, um, and certainly by the time we get to next week. But that worked wonderfully well. It was incredibly precise match to the experimental data that he was measuring. So we can calculate for hydrogen exactly where these excitation uh, levels are in at least those associated with the visible part of the spectrum just by using <coughs> that equation. Okay? Um, and later on, when people were able to do measurements outside of the visible range, so they strayed out into the infrared, they went out into the ultraviolet region, uh, when people began building detectors that would cope with those wavelengths, obviously the retina is not very good as a detector uh, in those regions, then all that needed to be done still to be able to explain everything that was observed was actually changing the constant in this bracket to another variable. The form of the equation, in other words, stayed the same. It's just this constant multiplied by these two things in here. And these are very simple integers. So m starts at 1, clocks up to 2, to 3, to 4. Right? They didn't realize it. These guys were doing some quantum mechanics. They were looking at quantization of energy. And then n simply clocks up above that. So whatever m is, n now becomes m plus 1, m plus 2, m plus 3. Right? So where m equals 2, we got this equation up here at the top. m equals 2 and n was 3 or 4 or 5 and so on. So what had been discovered actually was a number here that mapped out the energy to which our electron was making a transition. Right? It's relaxing back again. All the way down to m equals 1. In other words, the ground state. So depending on where we are going back to, all we need now is to know the energy level we're coming from back down to that lower energy. Hence this number always has to be bigger than uh, m. Yeah? So let's go back a little bit. I can see some head shaking. All right? So, visible part. This is the thing that was discovered first. It's a transition back to the second uh, quantum level, ground state, first excitation. <coughs> yes? So this is our first excited level. We can relax back from the next one, from the next but one, the next but two, the next but three, the next but four. Doesn't matter, we're always ending up at n equals two. So in our equation, this is taking now the role of m in our equation, so m is 2, 
right? And we can get a photon that comes from the next level up. So that's N in our equation. Sorry about these double uses of letters. That's just the way it is. I'm trying to keep it consistent with the textbook. So it's coming from 3 to 2, right? So in our equation later on, that's m equals 2, n equals 2 plus 1. But we could also come back from this level up here, n equals 4. So now <coughs> we're, coming, we're still coming back to n equals 2, but we're now coming from level 4. So it's m plus <coughs> 2 rather than m plus 1. Yeah? You might need to go away and mull this over and just put some numbers in. Right? So this is telling us where the final energy of our electron is in this transition. This is telling us where it's coming from. So it's relaxing from here to here. Yeah? And that's the point at which I'm going to stop and we're going to pick this up.